If you want to turn to Genesis chapter 5, what we're going to do is we're going to, in, in about three minutes time, I'm going to play you a, a, a video clip from World War II that lasts about five minutes, but that will really be the foundations of what we're going to be looking at, God willing, for the next about four weeks. Father, we ask, Lord, this morning for clarity. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, your word says that the common people heard you well. We pray for clarity, a crystal clear message, Lord. Lord, there has been an answer, Lord, to every generational problem. And we pray, Lord, that as we go through these weeks, we will discover what the answer is to ours. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I'm just going to begin by looking at this. You'll, you'll understand more as the, as the weeks unfold. But in Genesis chapter 5 verse 25, it talks about Methuselah. Methuselah lived 187 years and he begot Lamech. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years. He had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Methuselah was the, uh, uh, lived the longest age of any person, any account of any person. We know that the, the oxygen levels, many things were different back then that were conducive to long age, cellular life, etc. I want to look in this particular session at probably one of the longest living generations in centuries and they're known as the baby boomers so that's what we're going to be looking at in this in this particular session now it's interesting that if you look at the names of the uh, 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 of the descendants from Adam in in Genesis 5 Methuselah means his death shall bring his death shall bring. Lamech means despair, and Noah means either comfort or rest. Now, although these generations, if you like, the names go after each other, and this is really important, they coincided together. And so what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at what's known as the baby boomers, the generation that was born immediately after World War II. And then we're going to be looking at Generation X, which is kind of my, that what I was born into, and the problems that face each generation, and how we can get the gospel across to each generation. It might be different how we get the gospel across, but the message must never change. So you've got the baby boomers, you've got what's called Generation X, then you've got what's called the Millennials. Has anybody ever heard of the Millennials? You've got the Millennials, which our kids were born into that era. And then you've got something called Generation Z. And then even, they're called Generation Alpha now. Kids that have just been born around about now. We're living in a time, friends, where people honestly are scratching their heads at how can they possibly understand the Gospel today. And I'm convinced that as we look back, and we see what God has done in times past, it will give the church hope for the future because he's never let us down. He's always been there and he's a prayer answering God. Okay, the church needs hope. We need hope and hope does not disappoint. So we're going to start by looking at this video. I'm sorry if the audio is a bit bad, but it was done in 1940. But you'll understand the spirit of this. It's quite incredible. Faithful hour we turn, as our fathers before us have turned in all times of trial to God the Most High. Here in the old country, I have asked that Sunday next should be observed as a day of national prayer. And let us go forward to that task as one man. A smile on our lips 
and our heads held high. And with God's help, we shall not fail. The Empire responds to the King's call. And at Westminster Abbey, heart of the Empire, the statesmen, the soldiers, the ambassadors, and hundreds of ordinary men and women join the mighty congregation. Her Majesty Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands arrives a few moments before their majesties. No one here today could foresee the grave news that has come from Belgium. All the more, it is well for us to show the world that we still believe in divine guidance, in the laws of Christianity. May we find inspiration and faith from this solemn day. This is London. The Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Winston Churchill. Yesterday morning at 2.41 a.m. at General Eisenhower's headquarters, General Jodl, the representative of the German High Command and of Grand Admiral Dönitz, the designated head of the German state, signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea, and air forces in Europe to the Allied Expeditionary Forces and simultaneously to the Soviet High Command. Uh, hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. But in the interest of saving lives, the ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded along all the fronts. And uh, our dear Channel Islands are also to be freed today. The German war is therefore at an end. After years of intense preparation, Germany hurled herself on Poland at the beginning of September 1939. And in pursuance of our guarantee to Poland, and in common with the French Republic, Great Britain, the British Empire, and Commonwealth of Nations declared war upon this foul aggression. After gallant France had been struck down, we from this island and from our united empire maintained the struggle single-handed for a whole year. until we were joined by the military might of Soviet Russia and later by the overwhelming power and resources of the United States of America. Finally, almost the whole world was combined against the evildoers who are now prostrate before us. Our gratitude to our splendid allies goes forth from all our hearts in this island and throughout the British Empire. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing, but let us not forget for a moment the toils and efforts that lie ahead. Japan remains unsubdued. We must now devote all our strength and resources to the completion of our task both at home and abroad. Advance Britannia. Long live the cause of freedom. God save the King. Meanwhile, of course, Londoners had begun their non-stop two-day celebration. The end of the German war had come 11 months after the landings in Normandy. B-Day came less than a year after D-Day. Outside the gates of Buckingham Palace, the people gather in their thousands.
was it in the West End. All over the capital, as indeed in towns and cities throughout the country, it was the same story. So what can we learn from that, friends? Well, we can learn this one thing. Our God is a prayer answering God. He answers prayer. He answered the prayer of this country at the darkest hour that this country has ever been in. Something quite incredible happened. Our God is a prayer answering God. Now if you want to turn with me please to Ecclesiastes, we're going to begin to look at this um, subject. It's a massive subject and we're going to be covering a lot of ground. However, what you will see is the hand of God throughout every generation. God loves us, doesn't he? Amen. And he hasn't left us, friends. So however bad things seem to be getting, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3, to me, seems to be the perfect place to begin this adventure. To everything there is a season. We so need to understand this. Nothing remains the same. Not here. To everything there is a season. A time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born. A time to die. A time to plant. A time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill. A time to heal. A time to break down. And a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain, a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. The baby boomers were born immediately after Second World War and they have lived in an unprecedented time of peace. 35 to 65, depending on the historian that you read, between 35 and 65 million people were killed in the Second World War. It was utterly horrific. You know the amazing thing about the Second World War and Nazi Germany? Even atheists... Will, will, will admit that there was something devilish and demonic about that time. Even atheists will admit that. It's very strange. Well, the boomers came off the back of, of, of VE Day. Now, imagine VE Day. It's very difficult for us to imagine it. But for those of you that have had the all clear from the doctor or a surgeon, after four or five years of constant struggle, you know that feeling when you hear the all clear that somehow it's seeping into you that you've got your life back. Well, this is an entire continent, nations that all of a sudden had got their life back. Now, not long before that, they were pouring into the churches crying out to God for mercy. And God answered, as he does, as he so often does. What we don't necessarily see is that at V-Day, the people of Europe poured back into the churches to thank the Lord for what he'd done. Now you can understand to some degree, Europe was on its knees. There was nothing left. The infrastructure had gone. It, there, was, the, there was sickness and disease. It wasn't fit for a rat. 
You look at America, on the other hand, none of their infrastructure had been bombed. It had remained completely intact. And America ascended very quickly as the superpower of the day. They came out of Second World War, of course, very well indeed. Now, the baby boomers, and you, every, we can understand this. You imagine as young men and young women, imagine you're 19 or 20 years of age, you've gone through the war, you've seen things that you never want to tell your children about, and all of a sudden, it, life is right to have children. This is it. They've held back, they've held back, but now is the time. And they start to get married very early. Like, for the next almost 20 years, it was quite common for adults to marry in their late uh, teens or early 20s. And there was this boom, this population boom, unprecedented in world history. There had never been a population explosion like the explosion that took place in Britain and Europe and America. Boom! All these babies were born around the world. Incredible times. You've kind of got to see like a tidal wave way out in the ocean. Imagine a tidal wave way out in the ocean. Boom! And you get this huge dominant wave that's slowly making its way to the, se to the seashore. The seashore representing the end of their life when they slip from time into eternity. And the baby boomers, not their fault. No, it's nobody's fault in the time that they were born, or creed, or colour, or background. But the baby boomers were always the majority vote. Of course they were. It was a population explosion. And so the boomers, like a tidal wave, made their way through the decades. They went through the 50s with the rock and roll scene. They went through the 60s with the hippie flower power stuff. They went through the 70s with those kind of dark LSD days. They came into the 80s, through into the 90s. And as you go through in the 50s, they're 10 years of age. In the 60s, at, this is really important, at their most impressionable age, they're in the 20s. In the 70s, they're in the 30s. In the 80s, they're in the 40s. In the 90s, they're in the 50s. In the noughties, they're in the 60s. 2010, they're in the 70s. 2020, they're in the 80s. And this whole generation is about to crash out from time into eternity and dissipate in individual droplets before the throne of God. And that's what we're going to be looking at, friends. This this generation was an incredible generation. The, the, the change that took place, there'd never been a time like this. You go back to John Wesley. The, uh, sorry, not John Wesley. You go back to the Apostle Paul, or way before Paul. And he went around on a donkey. You go, you go fast forward 1,700 years, and John Wesley's doing the same thing. There's no change. But within the space of the baby boomer generation, there has been paradigm shifts that only now are we beginning to understand what's happened in their lifetime. And so, imagine VE Day. Imagine the all clear. And funny enough, Miriam, we were talking about this in the house group. I know because my mum and dad are baby boomers. The first 10 years of their life, now many of them can't remember that much about them, but there was rations, and it was incredibly difficult. The infrastructure had gone. It was just a massive rebuild. My mum and dad constantly used to tell me about what Christmas was like, when all you had is an apple and an orange, and do you remember that? You constantly told that, and we were happy, we were happy, they would say. And I think they were. I think they were. But the first 10 years particularly of the life of the baby boomers was incredibly difficult. And even the second 10 years, it was very, very difficult. Now, friends, we have to understand something about the miracle that allowed them to be born. Those of you know this, some of you may not know this, 
Britain at its darkest hour in 1940, all of the Allied soldiers had been trapped on the beaches of Dunkirk. The German army had pincered them and trapped them. 360,000 soldiers. We needed those soldiers back. And it looked, to all intents and purposes, like they were going to be bombed on the beaches and nothing would be left. If Britain fell, the world would fall. And so King George calls for this national day of prayer. Churchill said at that time, if we can get back between 20 and 30,000 troops, he'd be happy. They had a national day of prayer and 338,000 troops that were being bombed from the skies by the Stuka dive bombers. People were going over the English Channel with every kind of vessel you could imagine. They were bringing them in from all over the place. Common people risking their lives for the effort. They managed to get back 338,000 troops, which meant that Great Britain lived to fight another day, and we went into the Battle of Britain, and we stood alone for an entire year before anybody else got involved and helped us. The baby boomers never would have been born, and therefore neither would the Generation X or the Millennials. The world would be a completely different place. It was an absolute miracle. And we so easily forget that our God is a prayer answering God. Amen. However, it's just human nature. And human nature really in the, in the 50s and 60s was kind of like this. You work hard, you play hard. You work hard, you play hard. But something amazing happened in 1949, only four years after this. Now, you, you would think that this thing would happen in Berlin, where the German people are on their knees. They've been utterly humiliated, particularly the Christians, German Christians that have been taken in by this propaganda. And Berlin at that time had been divided by the Brits, the French, the Americans, the Russians. They were on their knees, the Germans. You would think that that would be the time that the German nation would cry out to God for forgiveness. But we don't really hear of it. No. You would think that there would have been something happening in Paris that would bomb to smithereens, or London. But we don't really hear of it. But something did happen. Only four years after World War II. But it happened in the most obscure place. Probably nobody on the earth would ever have guessed it. But this random, featureless, island off the west coast of Scotland, there were two old dears by the name of Peggy and Christine in their 80s that were concerned that the numbers in the church were going down. And by our standards of today, they were in revival. But they were concerned because the young people were leaving. They weren't going to church anymore. And these two old ladies realize that it doesn't matter what age you are, our God is a prayer answering God. And they began to pray four years after the war. And they prayed and prayed and prayed. They managed to get a few others praying with them. And after months and months of prayer, something unreal happened on the Isle of Lewis. God touched down on that island. You would have thought it had happened in Berlin. You'd have thought that it would have happened in Russia. You'd have thought maybe it would have happened with the, the, with the Jews that escaped this. But it, it, do you know where it happens? It happens when people call out to God. Amen. And they did Amen. with such fervency. They called out to God. Now you might think that it happened because the people on the Isle of Lewis wanted a revival. Well, you would be very wrong. Even though Lewis was a religious place and they, they had a, a reverence for the word of God, none of them wanted a revival. They'd seen them before. They know what happens when a revival happens. None of them wanted a revival. 
What God did on the Isle of Lewis was, was in effect, through the Holy Spirit, overpowered people that, that didn't mind going to church once a week, that didn't mind keeping the Sabbath holy, but that was as far as they wanted to go. And God swept across the island. And here's the amazing thing. It was a revival for the young people. And it was the old dears that had been praying it through. And God, by His Spirit, brought hundreds of young people into the church. At four o'clock in the morning, they were meeting in the fields. They were meeting in homes. God physically shook people's houses. Duncan Campbell went over there. He was called over there. He didn't even want to go there. He says, I'll come over to do a two-week evangelistic crusade. He was there for two years. He couldn't get away from the place. There was meetings happening all the time. That's what happens. But here's the thing. Get this because this is so important. How do you know when a revival is real? I'll tell you how you know. Because the gospel is absolutely central to the revival. And when you look at men like Duncan Campbell, the gospel was absolutely central. And it's only the gospel that will cure the mess of this earth, friends. Nothing else. And an incredible revival happened and the gospel was central. However, on the shores of Great Britain and Europe, there was this new sound beginning to come through. And it was the sound of rock and roll. And rock and roll brought with it an energy that they needed because these were very difficult days. People worked very hard, but they they didn't just want to work hard. They wanted to play hard. And so from the black gospel roots really came this sound from Fats Domino, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Elvis, and rock and roll came on the scene. And suddenly it took the world by storm. And although we, are, we have heard rock and roll, we know what rock and roll sounds like, back then it was an absolute revolution. It made you dance. It, people pulled off dance moves that they didn't even know existed. No wonder there was a baby boom. No wonder there were so many people getting born at that time, folks. It was like some kind of jungle mating call on the dance floor. That was rock and roll. Basically, that's what it was. But then something else comes to the baby boomers just at the time when they're at their most impressionable. The swinging 60s. The swinging 60s. And the swinging 60s can kind of be divided between two halves. The more you look at it, the more you realise it. So you look at four scousers that had been listening to some rock and roll, well, a lot of rock and roll, over in Liverpool. They learn how to play the guitar, 12-bar blues. They realise they're addicted to this stuff. They go over to Hamburg. They ply their trade. They they are spotted, of course, and uh, they're brought in. They're made to take off the leather jackets and put suits on. And... The songs that they sang were really very upbeat and positive, and they were mainly about meeting a nice looking girl, and I want to hold your hand, you know. I'm in love with her, and I feel fine. And that was kind of like the music for the first half. Beautiful harmonies, lovely jingly guitars, and don't underestimate the power of music. Music moulds a generation. And whatever these people sing, they're kind of almost like false prophets, because they predict... Where, the, where this thing is headed. And so for the first half of the swinging 60s, it was very, very positive. And I remember my dad talking about it. My dad, was ne- he never got into the hippie thing. He would go to the church disco and he'd listen to, how do you do what you do to me, all these kind of things. And that was it. And that was pretty much as far. But something happened in the middle of the 60s that was changed everything. And it, it, so many things come together at that time. You've got Eastern mysticism, which began to come to the shores of Europe and this country. Suddenly, for the first time, instead of this nation being a Christian nation, all these Eastern religions are, are, are coming into the situation. In America, you've got counterculture. You've got suspicion over 
the uh, presidencies. They, they don't trust people anymore. You've got the whole social justice thing, which is gathering momentum. You've got Martin Luther King standing for equal rights, and so he should. You know, folks, people remember what happened with the Jewish people, and it was horrific. But way before that, there was 400 years of demonic slavery of black people. Absolutely cruel. They didn't even treat them like animals. And Martin Luther, I believe Martin Luther King was raised up by God at that time in America when America was utterly racist. And God raised up a man at that time. And you've got this whole counterculture thing. And the speeches that that man made, folks, they, they make you, you, the, you, the, your spine shiver. I have a dream. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty I'm free at last. And this was the counterculture. This was what was coming in. You've got JFK who was shot at that time. And of course, the young people in America start to get very suspicious about the, the American government. And I can understand why. You've got the Vietnam War. Why should they join in with this war? These are the baby boomers. They've never seen a war. They don't want to be in a war. They certainly don't want to go to an unjust war. And so they start to experiment with LSD, with amphetamines, with cocaine, particularly in America. These things began to come in. And there was, at the, at the kind of height of the second half of the 60s, it can all be epitomized really in one song. And they managed to even bring in some of the 60s bands together to sway together like this and sing, All you need is love. Wah, 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 wah. All you need is love. Wah, 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 wah. And they got to that stage where they honestly believed all that was needed is love. And they got the social justice part right. It needed to be right. But love was never determined. It was never defined. They had no idea what love was. They were told all you need is love. But their idea of love was kind of like, hey man, just chill out. You know, just chill out. Whatever goes, let it go, man. You know, whatever comes in, just let it happen. Whoever you want to be, whatever you want to identify as, just let it happen. Because love is all you need. The problem is, friends, that this is not love. This is not love. This is unbridled sin. Is what it is. This is what the Bible... So what you had in the 60s was this kind of juggernaut of hedonistic pleasure. This unstoppable juggernaut. You know, when people commit suicide in front of a train and they stand there on the railway lines and the train's going at 70 miles an hour, you don't even hear the impact. The train is just like, whatever. Uh, can you imagine being in a church at that time Seeing all these hippies doing all this stuff where everything went, where they had no real understanding of what love actually was. What are the churches supposed to do? How do you stand against that? And in the same way that we have the same problem today with the LGBTQ, the whole woke thing, there was the same problem back then, exactly the same. How on earth can God move? You've got the, the Beatles that went from all these lovely innocent songs to the, the, the Revolver album. And those of you that know about the Beatles, you know that was a defining point. When they wrote the Revolver album, everything changed. And John Lennon wrote a song called Tomorrow Never Knows. It was utterly demonic. And they got into all this Eastern mysticism. You've got um, the abortion legalised. You've got the pill. All of a sudden, instead of people being married really young and having lots and lots of babies, people are holding off. They're not getting married young anymore. They're holding off. They're getting married late. And because all you need is love, well, I can get divorced because my wife doesn't really love me. They just had no idea. Of, uh, and, and this stuff that you see, look at the music dictates that generation. Look at the bands of the latter half of the 60s. Look at the Doors. The Doors, 1965, they came on the scene. The first record was Break On Through to the Other Side. It was all about breaking on through into this Eastern mysticism. George Harrison was... Totally taken in by all this, as you probably know. John Lennon wasn't actually. Lennon saw that the Maharashi was a con man, and he was a con man. 
He was actually, he wanted to fling with some of the Beatles' wives. He wrote a song uh, on the White Album about the Maharashi. He, he called him Sexy Sadie. He likened him to a seducing woman. He says, you broke the rules. You laid it down for all to see. You've made a fool of everyone, but you're going to get your comeuppance, Maharashi. You're a con man. And here's the thing. Sin eats you from the inside out. So we look now, church, at this, all this stuff that's happening. And we think, what, what can we do? We can't do anything. There's nothing that we can muster up that's going to help the situation. Just like they did back then. We need the Holy Spirit today. There's no shortcuts to this. On the Isle of Lewis, God touched down. And you know it was a true revival because the gospel was right in the middle. Well, in, this, in, the, in the latter half of the 60s, when they are so disillusioned by the governments, stoned on LSD, and I've been, at, well, not LSD, but mind altering drugs, I've taken them, folks. I've, I've tripped my brains out for 12 hours solid. So I know what that feels like. And it, makes, it just makes you feel even worse. For every false high, there's an equivalent low. And there comes a point where you just can't party anymore. Your body's telling you. Your body is saying, you're sinning against me. Never mind, God. What are you doing to me? And in this moment where the churches had no answer... No answer. There wasn't one. What we didn't realise is everybody looks fine on the outside. They look as though they've got it together. They were falling to pieces on the inside. Because sin eats you from the inside out. And the wheels came off that hedonistic juggernaut. And do you know what happened? God touched down. You would never think it. It, it, it doesn't seem possible. When you look back in history, think, what can stop rock and roll? What's more powerful than rock and roll? Come on. That is some sound. What is more powerful than rock and roll? What's more powerful than the music that you see in the 60s? I used to sit there and listen to the doors and think, my goodness me, this is so powerful. What can stand against that stuff? And the Holy Spirit touched down. And hippies began to make their way into churches, barefooted and ridden in B.O. And they'd come into the churches, and a lot of the churches didn't want to know, like, we don't need your sort in here, even though there's only 15 of us, and this church can hold 200. Like, we, we, we'd rather keep it that way. There are other pastors that said, rip out the, rip out the carpets. If that's, what you, if that's your problem, take out the carpets. They're coming in. Yeah, that's it. And God touched down, friends. God touched down. And there were many hippies at that time that had had a Christian kind of background that started to cry out to God. There were pastors at that time that hadn't got a clue. How is God ever going to get through? But he did. He did. And there was a genuine, bona fide revival in the late 60s known as the, the, the Jesus Movement. And friends, when revival happens, true revival happens, the gospel always becomes the centre you see, what is the anecdote? What is the cure to sin? What's the cure to these things? It's the gospel. Yes. It's never going to change. And you know it was real because the gospel was central. And the two things that you see in the Jesus movement was the preaching of the gospel, preaching of repentance and discipleship. They opened up all these hippie houses everywhere. And you didn't just go in and have an hour. They lived together. And boy, if you live together, you've got to love one another. So they really began to realise what love was. Like, all you need is love. Well, they were introduced to love. They'd heard about love through this whole flower power generation. And it came to nothing. And then they were introduced to the love that will not let us go. And so many of them went on to become evangelists and teachers and pastors, open churches, Calvary Chapel. It was a revival. It was a revival. People think, and they always think this, 
yeah, I can understand that that happened back then, but it just can't happen today. That's what they thought back then. Oh, well, it's all wrong. I, I, I can't see God changing anybody's life today. Oh, there's no hope at all. What would Jesus say about that kind of thinking? When he promises in Matthew 28 that he'll be with us all the way to the end of the age. Oh, well, there's no answer to these Generation Z. It's off the chart. We've never seen anything like it. Folks, little Richard would have made the woke brigade blush. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. <clears throat> Let's go on. Have a look at Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12. In Ecclesiastes 12 it says, Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. What advice. What advice. In the days of your youth, when you are most impressionable. And by the way, when the swinging 60s were going on, this church was booming. God was doing something in this place. And in the Pentecostal churches around the area. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. When you are most impressionable. Listen, and I'm talking to the baby boomers here. We take this for granted. We should never take this for granted. Never take for granted what Martin Luther King did. Never take that for granted. That was incredible. We went to Liverpool yesterday. We looked at the slave trade in the, in the museums in Liverpool. Words can't describe... Words can't describe what they did to people of a different colour. You can't even begin to describe it. And Martin Luther King stood his ground, yeah. paid the ultimate price. And you've got young Billy Graham. Now listen, friends, there's not a perfect teacher or preacher or movement or denominator. They don't exist. <laughs> you get to a certain age, you realise they don't exist. You realise it's fool's gold. You're looking for something that doesn't exist. However, in his earlier years, that man disciplined himself to bring a very simple gospel message that anybody could understand. And that takes some discipline. And people today, I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of my... I think that Christians today think they've outgrown the gospel. I honestly do. I, I watch him. I, I see you. And... And I see people switch off when you start talking about the gospel. It's like, we know all this. You know, come on, let's talk about something that we don't know. John Wesley was an incredibly intelligent man. George Whitfield, incredibly theologically minded, brilliant man. C.H. Spurgeon, the same. Some of the greatest minds this world has ever known. Discipline themselves to always bring the gospel because the gospel is the only hope. There is no other hope. There's no other hope for woke or LGBTQ. There's no other hope for churches that are now saying that God is gender neutral or whatever else is coming next. There is no other hope. And you know when there's a true revival because it will go back to the gospel. And people take Billy Graham for granted like, yeah, of course there was Billy Graham. You know what I mean? Like, obviously. Why is it obvious? He didn't have to do that. Where are the gospel preachers today? God raised them up. People that have preached the gospel today. Instead of coming out with all these ridiculously silly arguments all the time. Can you imagine the, 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 the black Negroes in the slave ship debating whether they're pre, middle, post-tribulation? God raised up amazing people. David Wilkerson and so many others beside. You lived in a time where the Lord's prayer was normal. What a blessing. You lived in the time of Gideon's Bibles being handed out. You lived in the time where the schools sang hymns and worship even. 
This was a Christian nation as far as you can be when the God of this world is Satan. It was as Christian as you're probably going to get. You had free education. Why? Because you're the boomers. Because of the majority vote, that's not your fault. It's not your fault if you're born into prosperity or peace. That is not your fault. But nevertheless, God was very good to you. You had free education. You had cheap houses. You were even allowed to buy council houses and they still wave at the man. They still got to stick it at the man. They still got to rage at the machine. Well, I am not happy. Oh, it's a, you've been, you, you're able to buy a council house, keep it a few years and sell it for massive problems. Nevertheless, I am not happy. There's never been a generation like this generation. There's never been a generation that's been more blessed, ever. You've had cheap transport, air travel, amazing pensions, low wealth tax, cruises, the best healthcare system in the whole of the history of the world. You've had disposable income that's gone through the roof and you are the longest living generation for centuries. Do you feel good? <laughs> Bring it on, brother. And you know what? God loves you. God loves you. And he wants you to know what love is. And love was not defined by John Lennon. And the more you read about... You know, when I, when I was, uh, when I was in, uh, in my teens, I, he was one of my heroes. I listened to some of that, the stuff that that man says now. I cannot believe... He, uh, I idolised him. I cannot believe it. But he was, to me, he was an absolute... Now I just think he talked absolute nonsense... I didn't even, they didn't even believe in it. They didn't even believe in what they were saying. Just clickbait. The clickbait of its day was all you need is love. But don't follow it. You don't need to do anything about it. Pay lip service to it. So this is what he says. Remember now you're creating the days of your youth before the difficult days come. And the years draw near when you say I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are not darkened. And the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble, that's your legs, and the strong men bow down, that's your shoulders, when the grinders cease because they are few, that's your teeth, and those that look through the windows grow dim, they're the eyes, when the doors are shut in the streets, those are your ears, when the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of a bird because you can't sleep well anymore, anything will wake you up. And all the daughters of the music are brought low. Also they are afraid of the height and of terrors in the way when the almond tree blossoms. That's the white hair on your head. When the almond tree blossoms. When the grasshopper is a burden, that's because the older you get, even the smallest things become a real hassle to you. And it happens to us all. When the grasshopper becomes a burden, the desire fails. For man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. And you know this, the older you get, the more funerals you have to attend. Well, friends, the baby boomers were like a tidal wave going through the decades. Boom! Way out at sea. And this tidal wave made its way through the 50s. and They were 10. They're going through the 60s. I'm in love with her because I feel fine. They get to the late 60s and it's the Maharashi with goodness knows what else. They get through into the 70s, it gets even weirder. They get through into the 80s, you've got the microchip. Through into the 90s, you've got the yuppies. And on they go, marching like a tidal wave through the generations with the best pension plans you can have to offer, the best healthcare system you could possibly want, and living far longer than any other generation before them has ever lived. And they still take it for granted. Uh, A friend of mine, she's a Christian nurse, she was telling me in, in the hospitals the amount of times families come in shouting at the surgeon because their grandma that's 96 is not going to be able to have the operation that they demand. Because this generation has never been confronted with death. They've never known that kind of life. They're not like the silent generation before them that literally grinned and bear it and lived through two horrible world wars. And to them, they just can't get their head around dying. It's alien to them. 
They've had the best of everything. And death is not on the menu. But here's the thing. One out of every one person's will die. Now let's have a look at um, 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 20. I just want to show you something. Just going to use this as, as an example. 2 Kings 20. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. God comes to Hezekiah and says to Hezekiah, your time is up. All I need you to do now is put your house in order and get ready to die. Hezekiah comes to the Lord and he weeps bitterly. Nobody wants to die, folks. Nobody wants to die. It's not in us. But nevertheless, it's something that we have to accept. It's going to happen. And so, uh, and so Hezekiah weeps and weeps before the Lord. He says, remember what I've done, Lord. And the Lord extends his life by 15 years. 15 years. This generation has lived... We all know it. You look at people in the 70s, they look 60. You look at people in the 80s, they look 70. You look at people in the 90s, they look 80. It's almost like they've been given an extension like Hezekiah. But what do you do with that extension? What do you do with that extra time that the Lord has given you? I'll tell you what Hezekiah did. He showed the enemy how rich he was. That's what he did. He said, come and have a look at how we're, and, and, and the things that I've achieved. Come and have a look. And it tells you in Chronicles, pride entered into him. And I am massively overgeneralizing here. But the amount of baby boomers I've talked to, and you know what's on their lips. It's coming. You know it's coming. What's your job and how much do you earn? You know it's there. And it might take some a bit more time than others, but they want to know, what's your job and how much do you earn? And there are so many people that they, they've plateaued. They've summited. There's nowhere else to go. If you're a baby boomer, there's nowhere else to go. You've got to get ready to meet the Lord. I'm fascinated by people that, that decide they want to climb Everest because they're not all what you think. A lot of them have just got too much money. They don't know what to do with it. Seriously. And so to, to climb Everest, it's between forty and $60,000 just to get there. Some people turn up at base camp. Yes, they're fit. They're physically fit. But technically, they haven't got a clue. They, it's, it's a tick box. It's just something they need to do. They've had people turn up at base camp that don't know how to put crampons on. And they're going to climb and summit Everest. But they're determined people. They're fit people, not technically minded in terms of mountaineering, but they're determined. And the boomers are and have been a determined people. They've come through the generations that they've worked exceedingly hard. But when you're at base camp, your leader will tell you, you don't need necessarily to worry about the, about the slog up Everest. As hard as it is, as torturous as it is to, to, to climb through the death zone, your biggest problem is going to be when you reach the top. And if you get to reach the top, it is the most dangerous place to be. And when Hezekiah reached the top and plateaued out, he said to, 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 to Nebuchadnezzar's servants, come and have a look, guys. Come and see what I've achieved in my life. Come and have a look. See what you think. I've, I've told you this before, but it, I'll tell you again. Three years ago, Christmas Day, I was at my mum and dad's. And my dad said he sort of got an announcement to make. We were sitting there at the table, food, three generations there. And I thought, oh, this sounds... Is he, is he going to confess Jesus? Is, that, is he going to give God the glory? I actually, it, the way he sort of went about it, I thought, something's coming here. And he says, you see this house? You see this food on the table? 
I thought he's going to actually give God the glory. He said, none of this would have been possible if it wasn't for the Tory government. <laughs> I, I, I kid you not, in my mind I thought, if I never have another Christmas in this house, it won't be a bad thing. That's what I thought. I just couldn't believe that this man had the guile, having had parents that were both Christians, to come out with that. Ugh! Horrible! Horrible! Well, Isaiah comes to see Hezekiah. What have you just done? I've just shown them all how much I've got. How well I've done in life. Isaiah says, they're going to come back. And they're going to take everything that you own. That's what's going to happen. And you know what Hezekiah said, don't you? Well, if that's the way it's going to be, but not in my lifetime. If that's the way it's going to be, but not in my lifetime. There's two kinds of baby boomers, really. There are those that have seen these massive scientific, scientific advancements. And they have this hollow faith in humanity. Because they were born after the war and they, they, they have no real experience, apart from films, of what it was like to suffer that way. And so their faith... My dad's like this, his brother's like this. Their faith is, 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 is that humanity will always find a way. Then there are baby boomers that know they've got the nous to see the patterns. And they see the patterns and they listen to their parents from the silent generation. And they know the same patterns that led to the rise of the Nazi party are beginning again. They see the patterns. But they say this. Not in my lifetime. Not in my lifetime. And if that's you, God deliver you from those thoughts. Because who could possibly tell people about the solution to the mess that we have today, but those that lived through the 60s and saw what God did back then? So while you've got breath in your lungs, you've got a mission. And your mission is not to shut your mouth and listen to people that know nothing about life. Your mission is to speak up and tell them about a God who truly is love personified. And how he can change people's lives. Very quickly, let's look at the gospel. Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53 verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. That's that entire generation. All you need is love. Go do what you want, man. We're chilling out, all of us. Well, if that's what you think is right, you go. You're my brother. All have gone their own way. They've all turned away to their own thing. How many funerals? And it terrifies me. Terrifies me. You know when you go to the crematorium and you're doing a funeral, you're attending the funeral and you can hear the funeral that's in the crem at the time and you can hear Sinatra being played. Another baby boomer going out saying, look at all the wealth I have and now the end has come and now I face my final curtain and now much more than this, I did it my way. And out they go from time into eternity with no real understanding of what biblical love actually looks like, they've had their chances. You can't say you've not had your chances. You can't say that God has not sent men that have preached the gospel. You can't say there weren't churches there. You can't say there weren't Bibles there. You can't say that the education system was against you or any of these things. You have no excuse. There's none. None whatsoever. But here's, here's love. Here's love defined. To me, this is love. Here's a load of people doing their own thing, going their own way, chilling out after themselves, worshipping at the altar of me, myself and I. First generation with self right in the middle. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
while we were busy doing our own thing, feathering our own beds, chilling out after ourselves, defining what's right and wrong, God sent his son to die in our place and he took all that filth that we experimented and did and he put it upon his son. That's love. That's love. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were sinners and we have a whole generation that think that by doing a few good things, they're going to go to heaven. They believe that. Why do they believe that? Because so many of them have never really heard the gospel. Not because they they had no access, because they didn't want to hear it. (coughs) But no good works will give you access Into eternal heaven. No good works. Never. It's not based on your good works. It's not based on how bad you've been either. It doesn't matter how bad you've been. Whether you've just lied a few times. Or whether you've murdered somebody. Where sin abounds. Grace abounds. All the more. And no matter how much sin there is. Look at the 60s. Grace. Grace for you. Grace for your sin. Grace for your mess. Piled upon Jesus. The gift of eternal life given. That is love. That's love. John chapter 15 verse 13. Greater love has no one than this. That he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you. What did Jesus command the baby boomers? Repent and believe the gospel. Believe this good news that what Christ said is true is true. That He took our sin. There's nothing we can do apart from believing. Oh, you can't get your head around it, can you? How can you get your head around that? Psalm 51. Psalm 51, David had committed adultery, he'd lied, he'd had a man killed. And in Psalm 51, David says to God, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, or according to your steadfast love. This is not a fickle love. This is not a touchy-feely love. Oh, you've offended me there. Oh, you know, I thought you knew what the hippie sin was all about, but you don't really know, do you? No, this is a steadfast love that never changes. Listen to the words of this hymn. Told Mandy, I want this at my funeral. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. O light that follows all my way, I yield my flickering torch to thee. My heart restores its borrowed ray, that in thy sunshine's blaze its day may brighter, fairer be. O joy that seeketh me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain, that morn shall tearless be. O cross that lifteth up my head, I dare not ask to flee from thee. I lay in dust life's glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms red life that shall endless be. There is a love that if you could experience him for a millisecond, you would buckle down to the floor crying like a baby. We're coming to a close this morning. (laughs) Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14. Paul says, I want you to know. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, 
according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Holy Spirit. Let it be, Lord, in the inner man. Strengthen us, Lord, that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, listen, may be able to comprehend with all of the saints the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge. There is a love that sadly many hippies never even found. And sadly many, many baby boomers have somehow managed to, to dodge all the way through their life. This incredible love. And they're going to crash from time into eternity. And they're confident that they've done enough good work to get to heaven. They're confident because they've never really been exposed to the Bible, the truth of the Bible. That if your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Paul tells us at the end of his life, well... He tells us in Romans, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any created thing. Paul is persuaded, church, that there's nothing that can come against this church and all the bills of the past. There's nothing that will ever separate us not even death itself, from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. If you're a baby boomer, the chances are you are going to, you are going to leave an inheritance to your children at some point. The question is, what's your inheritance? You're at the top of the mountain, there's nowhere else to go for you. You're done. It's only a matter of time, you're done. Your time is done. You're going to give your inheritance to the next generation. What is your inheritance? It's either one of two things. The wages of sin is death. Yes. If you want to inherit the, 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 the reward of all your sin, you can. If that's what you want, you can inherit the reward of all your sin. And you will be eternally separated from God forever. And there are many stages to that which we don't even want to go down. But if you want to inherit the reward for your sin, go ahead, do it. But the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life. The inheritance that God has for every person is eternal life through Christ Jesus why on earth would you choose to do it your way? What are you going to do with Jesus? Amen. Amen.